Thank you kindly, Mr. Speaker. Our colleagues invite us today to become the first Congress in the history of the United States to hold someone in contempt for complying with our demands. And their target is the Attorney General of the United States. Attorney General Garland gave us the special counsel's report on President Biden in full. He made the special counsel available to us in committee for hours of testimony where he answered all our questions, and he provided the full transcript of the president's voluntary five-hour interview with the special counsel, all 250 pages of it. The whole world can read President Biden's interview and his answers unedited. But that's apparently not enough. Now they want to hold the attorney general in contempt for not turning over the audio tape of the interview that we have the verbatim transcript of. And why is that important? Well, in case you've lost the thread of this madcap wild goose chase, America, remember this is an impeachment investigation. Do they think that the holy grail of the 118th Congress, evidence of a presidential high crime and misdemeanor, is lurking in the pauses or the background throat clearings and sneezes on the audio tape? Well, of course not. They know there's no high crime or misdemeanor to be found because they've spent the last 17 months and millions of our taxpayer dollars looking for it, and it simply does not exist. They literally don't even know what they're looking for anymore. So why do they want it? Well, they're hoping that in the five hours of President Biden's testimony, they can find a mispronounced word or phrase or a brief stammer, which they can then turn into an embarrassing political TV attack ad. Get it, America? That's what this is all about. And holding the Attorney General of the United States in contempt is one more useful distraction from the complete and devastating implosion of the Biden impeachment probe, which of course was the number one priority of these talented leaders. Remember, they promised to reveal the greatest presidential high crime and misdemeanor in American history, an act of treachery and deceit that dwarfs even the impeach even the incitement of a violent mob insurrection and an attempted political coup that took place right here against our Constitution, our Congress, our Vice President in this chamber. But after their truly prodigious investigation, punctuated, admittedly, by some unfortunate mishaps like Chinese spies, fake evidence, pornographic displays in committee, and their own witnesses testifying that there were no grounds for presidential impeachment, they have nothing to show for their arduous work other than one more debunked Russian disinformation operation and one more indicted GOP informant and star witness. Rather than admit defeat in this bumbling operation and look for some other way to actually aid the public good, they've decided to flail about in mock outrage against a series of phantom tyrants in the hopes of distracting everyone from this epic flop. Their first distraction was to impeach Secretary Ali Mayorkas as a paltry consolation prize, but that pathetic decoy action blew up in their hands. Then the plan was to skip the mundane work of casting votes and actually doing committee business to travel on a collective spiritual pilgrimage on Amtrak to New York City to attend the criminal trial of an unmentionable American felon, one of 19 million in the country. But that strange journey to Mecca also blew up in their faces when this mystery political false prophet was convicted unanimously by a jury of his peers on dozens of felony criminal counts in a fair American trial. They tried to salvage the credibility of this bizarre expedition by blaming the American justice system for being weaponized against Republicans. But this political extremism quickly melted away when the son of President Biden, the original target of their wrath, was also prosecuted and convicted, like another disarmed felon whose name may now not be spoken on the floor, apparently, by a unanimous jury of his peers on all counts against him. And that trial, unlike the trial whose very existence must be sent down the Orwellian memory hole to save someone hurt feelings, was actually tried in the federal system. So what's left to do now? Well, let's hold the Attorney General of the United States, Merrick Garland, in contempt, of course. This will be sure to placate an unrepentant and anonymous convicted felon from New York and distract everybody else for a day or two. I confess it's a bit rich, Mr. Speaker, to be asked to hold 
the Attorney General of the United States in contempt of Congress for overwhelmingly complying with the committee's demands by members who voted against contempt citations for Steve Bannon and Peter Navarro, two persons subpoenaed by the January 6th Select Committee who never spent a single minute. Could I have the one more? The gentleman's time has expired. I grant the uh, gentleman an additional minute. Bannon and Navarro never spent a minute with the January 6th committee, never turned over a single document to our committee. These people had 0% compliance with Congress. They demonstrated true contempt, which is why they've been sentenced to jail. But Chairman Comer, in his wisdom, would hold the Attorney General of the United States of America in contempt for what I think is 100% compliance, but in any event is something like 98 or 99% compliance. If you think a federal official has not rendered proper compliance, you take them to court, you don't hold them in contempt, and it's rich beyond measure, like a billionaire rich, to be asked to hold the Attorney General in contempt by people who themselves received subpoenas to testify before the January 6th committee who never rendered a single document nor a single minute of testimony to the January 6th committee. I urge Congress to reject this absurd motion, and I'm happy to yield back to the chairman.